Sally Kempton, welcome to Rewilding. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Well, it's my pleasure, Sabrina. Oh, I am so excited to have this conversation, especially with your upcoming course on cultivating Shakti. Yes, and it, it, is, uh, it is one of the primary things we do in life is talk about <laughs> right. in one way or another. So, yeah. I would love to, Sally, if it feels all right for you to really start, if we could, if this feels okay, to start at kind of ground level with Shakti. I know most of our listeners are well aware of Shakti. We have a lot of conversations around divine feminine, around Shakti, around life force, around this creative essence, around this, this kind of aspect or way of working with the divine. But I would love if you could bring some words to that and as a way of starting this conversation into cultivating Shakti, if we maybe just start with Shakti. Yes. And uh, as you probably know, talking about Shakti is difficult because Shakti, what Shakti is, is the underpinning of everything that we talk about and of talking itself. You know, so, so from several points of view, on one level, Shakti is the dynamic aspect of the divine. You know, in the Kashmir Shaiva Tantra tradition, which is the tradition that I base all my teachings on, there's an understanding that, which I'm sure that most of your listeners are very well aware of, that 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 nature of reality, the nature of the divine, is both stillness, transcendent isness, and dynamic manifestation. So Shakti is that aspect of the divine, which which is the creative force, which manifests planets and worlds, and you know the the kind of hallmark of the Indian traditions on goddess, on, on the divine feminine, is that goddess is among her other attributes, she's the veil, she's the maya that keeps us from really recognizing our true self, from, you know, from seeing the divine core that we all are. So, and, and the, the mythological kind of um, imagistic way this is described is that in in order to manifest a universe she draws a veil between the two halves of herself so that so that consciousness cannot see itself which of course is a problem we all have we, we can't really understand we can't really grasp the fact that our awareness is our is our primary primal self so in the process of awakening or of you know of self transformation in in my experience, and in of course the tantric traditions, the number one priority is to activate the aspect of shakti, which uh, which tends towards liberating consciousness. So it's literally a question of getting her to turn her focus around, so that instead of constantly pushing your attention outward, you she begins to draw it inward, and you begin to be able to see through the veil of your own thoughts and uh, and really understand what is actually happening in your heart in your gut in your in the, you know in, the, in your inner brain uh, and recognize what it is that's actually powering your life and allow that force to you know to take over to the point where you can begin to recognize yourself as an actual embodiment of divine suchness so that's that's pretty much the heart of of, of what I try to unfold for help people get or unfold. Just them. that, just, just that. Saying, yes. <laughs> yes. And even in this, you know, short few minutes of you speaking, there's this, and I kind of want to share this with everyone listening and who ends up seeing this or watching this in some way is Sally, you have this amazing way of facilitating of teaching of, of of holding a space where it's such a dance it is this it's you know and i've been in a few of your telecourses and it's practice which weaves into myth which weaves into talk which weaves into practice but the whole time is this glorious amazing dance and i want to point that out because i was just feeling it in that 
short few minutes and I want to invite everyone listening to kind of let that just let themselves maybe be open to right. that. Yes. 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 Yeah. And and I, I think the thing that is important to me and that is part of what we explore in the classes that I that I teach and and which I think more and more of us are learning how to explore and live with is the utter interpenetration of the divine with the human. You know, so, you know, we're obviously at a point where uh, human doing has created many magnificent things in this world, but also created some very problematic things. You know, so so we're at a, we're at a place where we actually it, it you know that demands an enormous amount of integration and self responsibility and also a kind of surrender so and I, what i've found is that really understanding shakti understanding the the nature of the weave between you know the, that which is the source of all this and our our own inner source is utterly crucial you know we we have to do it it's time to do it it's time for a lot of people to do it you know, whatever we call it, whether we call it devotion or enlightenment or awakening, um, you know, it's it's imperative that we we find a way to come from that that place of genuine inwardness in whatever we do. Hmm. So, I have this interesting question bubbling up, and I know we're moving our way toward the specifics of cultivating shakti and talking a little bit more about that. And I'm very excited to dive into that and just be very real and raw and honest about that. But there's this question around why Shakti? Why? Why Shakti and why now? Why Shakti as opposed to what? <laughs> as opposed to another tradition or another path or another doorway in. Well, yeah, it's an interesting question because I know for me, you know, I, when I first began walking the spiritual path, uh, I was in a Western tradition, which essentially uses the archetype, you know, the Western archetypes, which it, if we're talking about deities, you know, mostly we're talking about the Greek, the Greek art, deity archetypes. And um, when I met my guru, who he was, a, he was an Indian, and his frame of reference was Hindu. So in most of my practice, uh, I was focusing on the, really the archetypes as they're understood in Indian spirituality. And one of the things that I came to realize is that the understanding of the, of the two in one nature of the absolute reality, the, the fact that it is both transcendent and also imminent, you know, that, that in other words, there is this divine source, which, you know, one can experience, which is beyond the world, which is unchanged, which is, you know, which nothing that occurs in the physical universe can touch, you know, which is a, a reservoir of infinite peace and, you know, a power and love, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a part of that, of that transcendent stillness, which manifests as the world and lives as the world, lives in the world. Um, you know, and which takes the form originally of the life force of, you know, what in Sanskrit is called the prana, you know, which, which actually gives life, which is very much connected to the sun and, you know, the natural forces of the cosmos. Uh, so we discover life energy through our own prana, through our own breath, through, you know, through noticing the, the way the seasons change, through you know, seeing how growth occurs on the earth through the interaction of sun and water and seeds, etc. You know, we, in other words, we come to understand that there is this natural life force that is, that is actually all on its own, you know, creating more and more life on this planet, including in ourselves, and that it's an evolutionary force. You know, that it that it's developmental, it's cyclical, but it's also developmental. So what Shakti has to do with this and why Shakti becomes so such, a, such an incredibly 
important way to understand it, the way the world is, is because Shakti is Shakti is that life force. She is that prana. She's the she's the life in everything, but she's also beyond the physical. So, so in other words, and what that means from, you know, from a sadhana point of view, from a from a spiritual development point of view, is that the same life force, the same prana, which which creates life in all its forms, also serves as the bridge between the physical and the infinitely subtle transcendent world. So if you're interested in, you know, in experiencing the transcendent or in bringing the transcendent into the physical world, you can't, you really can't do it without a connection with Shakti. And um, most of the traditions, you know, including those who, who have no name for this force uh, are actually making use of the power of Shakti under different names because there, there is no other way to come to the divine without, without allowing this energy, you know, which for many of us is found in the heart, but which can be found anywhere without allowing this energy to unfold for us. So I hope that helps to explain something that I know is quite mysterious. That was so beautiful. And I feel just this dance happening in my whole body as you were speaking that just the joy, just this joy in my being. So yeah, that was beautiful and magnificent. I mean, I love that you spoke to other traditions, other paths, having other names for the same connection, the same force or maybe having no name for it. Right. Yeah, I love that you were able to weave that in too. Yeah. yeah. So, no, go ahead. Well, what I was gonna say is that once you've actually started to be awakened to the presence of Shakti, to the presence of, you know, of this particular form of subtle energy, then you begin to make connections in different traditions. You know, for instance, in, in Christianity, the, the name for Shakti is Holy Spirit, you know, it's the, or in the Gospels, uh, I believe it's the Gospel of John, uh, that at the, you know, at the Last Supper, at his final meeting with his disciples, Jesus says something like, I have to leave you so that the Comforter can come. And what he means is that, that this inner force that he calls the Comforter, you know, which is independent of his physical form, um, which has been you know, really the engine of transformation in that, in the Christian tradition for thousands of years is really Shakti, you know, it's, you know, is that, is the particular vortex of spiritual energy that, that is enlivened through that lineage, you know, as it's enlivened in different ways through other lineages, uh, but it's never absent. We should, say, we should say she is never absent, although often very deeply hidden. Yeah. I think you were reading my mind because Holy Spirit was rolling in my head as you were speaking earlier. Yeah. Um, if it feels right, Sally, I would love to move into cultivating Shakti. Yeah. Uh, well, the most, um, let's say, dramatic way in which we cultivate Shakti is by cultivating Kundalini, the, the spiritual energy that in, is traditionally said to live at the base of the spine, to be in, in a dormant form and which is awakened at a certain point, usually through contact with the teacher, but it can be awakened in any way and is, is a sufficiently dramatic event so that once Kundalini has been awakened you actually begin to be able to have a palpable sense of energy moving in your body. And uh, so whether you have, you know, one of those dramatic Kundalini awakenings that people often talk about, or whether your awakening is simply a, a subtle shift of your priorities, to, to actually cultivate Shakti, you, you need to begin to become aware of really the way energy moves and how you know, there, there's, there's energy in certain parts of your body 
there's energy in certain words that you use. There's energy, there's certain activities that create particular energies and you start to realize that there, that there are different forms of energy, uh, obviously physical energy, but different forms of psychological, emotional and human energy that we're very familiar with without really understanding exactly what, we, what they are. And among them is a, a kind of personal energy signature that we all have. You know, every one of us is, you know, again, this is probably not new to you, certainly not new to you and certainly not new to most of the people who are listening. You know, we, we, are, pri we are energy beings before we are physical beings. So to cultivate Shakti is to tune into our, our subtle energy and to learn how to make it expand in, let's call it positive ways, to expand toward more awareness, to expand towards more love, rather than uh, in the negative ways, you know, which uh, are actually much more accessible in this world than the positive ones, you know, that especially in this particular climate, there's an enormous amount of negative energy available. And, you know, what we learn to do in Tantra is work with all energies, including the negative energies, so as to transmute them into more positive, more loving, more open forms. And that's really what it is to cultivate Shakti. It's to tune into the energy that you're aware of in a situation and actually learn how to get it to expand in positive directions. Yeah. 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 So this course that you have coming up, it sounds to me, or actually, I don't even want to say that. I just want to kind of maybe talk a little bit more about what is in this course, what, and for those who will do the course, of course, they're going to dive in and they're going to really understand what it's about but even for those who maybe can't do the course or don't end up doing the course can you maybe just give an overview or a framework or here are some of the different components yeah uh i, I mean i'm not going to give the course away <laughs> but, yeah, no <laughs> but uh but it's essentially what what we'll what we'll do is work with the different avenues into direct connection with shakti with your own inner shakti which, which obviously include practices like pranayama and mantra, practices which are, are actually designed to uplift, you know, to upgrade the energy in your system, to infuse higher subtler forms of energy into your physical body. We'll work with goddesses, uh, with, you know, with some of the archetypal figures of the Indian tradition, maybe even a couple of Western goddesses. Um, and, We'll, we'll practice very much with some of the ways in which Shakti manifests in ordinary life, such as through emotions, through thoughts, mm -hmm. through you know, intense experiences of various kinds, and, and come to understand how we work with, with our, the ordinary expressions of life energy, such that anything, including, including experiences that seem very painful and negative, how anything can be turned into really an engine for awakening. So it's it's about how to cultivate the the aspect of your life force which wants to wake you up to the truth about yourself. And you know, and it, and uh, you know, again, in different traditions, different ways of uh, of cultivating shakti have have been uh, have been discovered and known, and uh, and we'll work with quite a few of them. So the idea is that when you're done with the course, you have, first of all, discovered several modalities for, for uplifting, and I would say up-leveling, upgrading your personal energy. And hopefully we'll have found some methods that, that actually work for you, that are, you know, that, are, that are significant for you, whether they have to do with personal deity forms or with mantras or with very simple, natural, practices involving the breath and the inner body. We're, we're going to work with all of those things. Can we speak a little bit? 
And this is almost just a question that comes in from our community quite a bit. And our community is a mixture of younger generation coming in and some older generations. And but some of the younger generation coming in, they, they're kind of really pushing against tradition. Right. And I would love to maybe just have a bit of a conversation around that, around maybe your relationship to tradition or maybe even how you speak about or would offer something around the gifts of tradition and also maybe where things are shifting or evolving to or where the younger generation seems to be, I don't know, moving things, just anything in that kind of territory that is there to share. Well, I, you know, one of the things that is important to understand is that there, there are different forms of tradition. There's, there's tradition that's stultifying, that keeps a lid on, on your expansion. And there's tradition which offers guidelines that have been really vetted over <laughs> hundreds of years by people who were very serious about their practice. So uh, I think, I know that in my own practice, I went very deeply into a tradition. I really ate it whole. And then gradually over a period of time, I began to discover what worked for me in it and what I could discard. And you know, that this is a kind of a time consuming way to practice. But one of the things that it does for us, you know, if we really come to understand a tradition from the inside, it's, it becomes easy to, to get not only in the tradition that we are primarily concerned with, but in every other tradition we encounter, it becomes very easy to see what's helpful in a tradition and what is either seriously unhelpful or can just be let go of and discarded. And I just, I don't think we can make a, a blanket statement about traditions, uh, though, you know, I, I could, in the, in the traditions that I'm familiar with, I can go through certain teachings and say, okay, this is worth paying attention to. Forget about that one. You know, here is something that you probably don't, aren't aware of, but that would be really helpful if you understood it. You know, I mean, there are a lot of things in the traditions, a lot of protocols about respect, for example, which I know the younger generation and me too, as, as a, when I was young, you know, young people are, <laughs> Revolutionary rebellion by nature. And you know, and the idea of respect often gets just mixed up with all the stuff that adults have been trying to make you do since you were two. You know, so so what does respect mean in the traditions? You know, for instance, for instance, there's there's something in every tradition that you don't put your you don't put sacred books on the floor, you don't put your feet on them, you don't treat them carelessly. And you know, on the one hand, they're just books, they're just paper and cardboard. It's not like, it's not like a, it's not like the Bhagavad Gita or, you know, or, uh, or the Bible has a particular um, sacred quality to the, the pages, um, you know, to the materials it's made out of. But it's also true that if, that if you treat a book that contains teachings with honor, it's, much more likely that the teachings will come into you and expand in you. Whereas if you treat it disrespectfully, it's, it's probably going to make it harder for you to assimilate what is true in those teachings. So, and this is the thing about tradition that I, that, you know, is, I think is really necessary and important as knowledge is passed on from generations through generations, you know, because every generation is going to get creative about about the old teachings. That's just part of what we're meant to do. We're you know we're meant to develop. We're meant to become more evolved than our parents, and our children are meant to be more evolved than us. And you know, and what a great thing that is. Um, but you know, for instance, you know, I I am not a I don't believe that the American Constitution is a sacred book. I understand how it came about. But on the other hand, it is the blueprint for how, you know, how American society is laid out. And there are certain 
assumptions that that come out of our you know post Western Enlightenment traditions, such as the importance of due process, um, you know the the way elections are set up, uh, many many things that are that are some of them are written in the Constitution, some of them are simply traditions. You know, and one of the things we discovered during the last presidency is that a lot of what we've taken for granted about our society is not set in stone, that somebody can come along and just say, screw that, I'm not paying attention to any of these norms, and essentially destroy the society, or, you know, destroy some of the underpinnings of the society. So, and I, this is happening, and I think it probably happens periodically throughout history in many different arenas, you know, that that, that, that political situations go through deep upheavals, religions go through deep upheavals. So um, the question is, what does the tradition protect us from? Mm. And what does the tradition uh, keep us from discovering? You know, so, and, uh, and I mean, I can say a lot more about it, um, but maybe you have something you'd like to add or something you'd like to. I think those two questions are so powerful and I'm loving this conversation. And I think everyone in our community will be loving this conversation and, and just feeling like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and yeah. I think really like having this conversation, maybe even diving into how can we hone that discernment piece in ourselves where just because something rubs us the wrong way doesn't mean it's not the perfect teaching for us. Exactly. exactly. So I'm wondering if you could just, yeah, this is beautiful. Yeah, well, it's so in terms of what a tradition protects us from, theoretically, and in the, you know, in the best case scenario, teachings have to keep teachings come down through lineages, you know, so and in most traditions, there are so called official lineages. And when you receive a teaching through such a lineage, you know, you, you know, in general, that it's, it's been protected, it's been held, you know, it, so it's not, you know, somebody who was sitting by a riverbank and suddenly saw a vision, you know, and decided that, that, you know, they should teach the, you know, the vision of three angels who, you know, who can come into your body and open your heart and, and, you know, please bow down and take my name. You know, that's, so a tradition hopefully will protect you from, you know, that kind of freelance craziness that, you know, that as, as we know has, has lived in the world for a really long time. So on the other hand, and, you know, most of the Orthodox traditions are guilty of this. The, uh, what a tradition will also protect is the assumptions and beliefs of the, of the priests, you know, of the authorities. And, you know, because m so many traditions are primarily engaged with, with protecting their, their sense of authority, you know, if you have a, a personal experience or an original idea, or if, you know, if you deeply understand that there need to be some sort of developmental shifts, you're likely to come up against a tremendous resistance from authority. So, and I think that's what youth in general you know, and what creative people in general run across in traditional situations. There's so much fundamentalism in every tradition. And I'm not going to mention any names, but there's no religious tradition that is free of sort of terrifying fund fundamentalist ideas, you know, in many cases. So, uh, so that, that's really the issue, which is the, what's the baby and what's the bathwater. <laughs> so, so and, and I think in general, you know, I, I would say, Fundamentalism is the bathwater. You know, fundamentalism is very useful at certain stages in their practice. Uh, there, you know, there are certainly times when, you know, having a belief that this is the way to do it, this is the way to, you know, work with the breath, this is the way to work with the mantra, this is the way to talk about the divine. It's very, very helpful, especially if you've been deeply engaged in a, you know, in a difficult life with a lot of confusion, which many of us are you know, to find a path where they tell you exactly what to do. You know, it's like, it's like putting a fence around a growing tree, you know, you, you know, it just keeps it, it keeps it going in, in the right direction. 
but at a certain point you're supposed to you're supposed to have found your own guidance you know and uh and you're supposed to be able to discern and uh and in order to have permission to discern in other words a lot of people come into religious or spiritual traditions and you know and they eat the teaching whole and then they believe that that's it that's all you have to do you just you just follow it you go on you know i teach meditation you go on practicing the meditation that you learned from your first teacher 12 years ago despite the fact that you know that within within you is this voice saying well why not try this or this has begun to stultify me you know so and uh it's so it's very important just to, to have a teacher and a tradition that that understands the need of the individual to find their own individual path within the tradition so that you don't have to leave you know in order to to do it in the way that that your heart is guiding you you know and and this i think is the great gift that that as modern practitioners as contemporary practitioners who are beginning to understand is is how to be within a tradition and yet to to be your own your own person within the tradition because you know and in you know in many of the older traditions uh there is a lot of room for this kind of thing you know so I know a friend of mine who was involved in, um, I guess you could call it a new age cult that I was also involved in for a while in my twenties. Uh, you know, and because it was a new religion, there was enormous emphasis on on saying and doing it exactly the way you were told to say and do it. And he told me at a certain point he left, and he began to study with. He, with a rabbi in Los Angeles, he began to study traditional Judaism. And he said, the thing he loved about it is that because Judaism is such an old tradition, there've been so many interpretations of the texts, that there's a lot of room. The space, the freedom. Yeah, there's a lot of space, a lot of freedom. You can, you know, you can see things differently. Uh, and, you know, if you're in the right community, it's, you know, it, it, the tradition itself will hold you while you do your exploration. And, and I think that's actually one of the great things about, you know, the traditions is that uh, they can, you know, they can do that if you have, but you need that said, the teacher, the, the community that you're learning in uh, has to be very clear about that, you know, and undefensive. Yeah. 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 There was this piece that you were speaking of, um, and it's this point on your own journey, on one's own journey, when it's not just to be drinking the tradition and drinking the practices and just doing the practices, but there's a point where it's your own inner teacher yeah. really comes to life. Can you maybe give, I know that that's a big question in our community around what does that feel like? How do I know? How, how do I know if it's I'm, I'm really authentically being you know, called to explore something a different way? Or yeah, if you have some words around that, that might be something beautiful. Um, yeah, and uh, that well, the, the standard answer, and and I do believe it is the correct answer. It's just a little bit hard to discern. Is that when the teaching is coming from your mind, from your surface mind. It's one thing when the teaching is coming from a deeper place. Yeah. It's another, and you know, for we there is nobody who doesn't have this question. <laughs> How do I know that my guidance is real guidance? How do I know that my intuition is real intuition? I mean, there are several ways that that we know. One is that, generally speaking, even when it's pretty intense, um, true teachings come from a positive place. In other words, the true teachings are never gonna tell you you're a sinner, you ruined your life, there's no hope for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a true teaching is always going to point a path and, and kind of cheer you onto it, but not necessarily flatter you. So, 
so that's, you know, that's one of the ways, you know, it's not going to be, a, you know, your inner guides are not going to beat you up, but they're also not going to tell you that you're the special chosen one. <laughs> <laughs> so the teachings of the inner guides are, they're, they generally speaking are non-dual uh, and, you know, and generally speaking, they're positive. So there's, and one of the ways, one of the things that I've, I've learned how to do when something comes up that feel that is different from, you know, from what I believe I should be doing is, is to really ask, ask, where is this coming from? Is this coming from the sacred space? Is this, is this coming from God? Is this coming from, you know, from, uh, from my deepest truth? And generally speaking, you'll get a truthful answer. You'll get a feeling. Maybe it's like a, uh, uh, if it's a yes or, you know, a different kind of, uh, if it's a no. And so it's very important to, you know, to just keep asking, is this, is this, is this path correct? Should I continue to follow it? And then taking it one step at a time, you know, because truly speaking, guidance doesn't always come in the form of a voice or a vision. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. just way too convenient it would be way yeah, too exactly 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 i mean much of the guidance that i receive is not it it comes as a direction that i find myself walking in without yeah. necessarily having been told to take that direction or even knowing why i'm walking in that direction so this is you know and what it means to cultivate shakti is in part how do you learn how to follow, how to move through the seams of reality, uh, you know, in such a way that you're actually going in a direction that is taking you closer to the truth. So, and there's the only way I know to do that is by experience. Yeah. You know, you make mistakes, you learn what it feels like to be yeah. in a mistake state, and then you, you go on, you take the next step. Oh, you've just brought some beautiful words to some to this experience that I have often where I'm moving in a direction and then my mind will finally catch up. Yeah. It's like my mind finally catches on that. But I'm already I've already been three steps. I've been moved. <laughs> but the mind I is like, know. oh, wait, what? Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, and there are a lot of things involved in that. I, I mean, a lot of the time, I mean, you know, that famous experiment where they, I think it was an MRI, they, t they did an MRI and they saw that, that the, the, the arm moved before the brain commanded the brain to move, you know, so, so in a certain sense, we are being moved by, by, I would say, I believe by the life force. Yeah you know, in the direction of our intentions, right? And that's, you know- There's this full circle back to your cultivating Shakti and keeping that directional force toward love, toward love, toward the positive side. Yes, and towards growth, you know, towards, towards genuine growth, towards what's good for the whole, you know, what's, what's just, just good for my selfish you know, small part and what's, What's good for the greater whole? What will benefit others as well as me? You know, those kinds of questions. Um, and the intentions to be a benefit to others and the intention to, to develop, to grow. Those, those ways of thinking create pathways that when the, you know, when movement happens, it will tend to move you along those pathways. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, about your personal journey, simply because I think it might help others who are wanting to step into sharing or teaching or facilitating or being of service in some way. So I wanna just make that really, really broad and really, really expansive, not necessarily a teacher, but to be in service of some, in some way. How did you know and I think we're in service all of the time, even when we're in absolute stillness and we're meditating and we're doing the dishes, but like that 
external service is more of what I'm talking about. How did you know when you were kind of called to move out of student into more of a, for you, a teacher space? Well, in the, uh, in the organization that I was involved with, there's not, there was not a clear demarcation. In other words, people with, you know, let's call, let's call, let's say advanced students, people who, you know, who had assimilated the teachings and also had communication skills would, as in many spiritual organizations, find ourselves teaching, you know, whether leading a, leading a study group or giving a talk. So it was actually kind of a seamless uh, transition. And then at a certain point, I left the organization um, partly for the for intellectual freedom I mean partly so that I could you know because I I was having impulses and understandings that while not at odds with my tradition were let's just say worded or understood slightly differently uh, and and also I you know I I was living a very very protected life I was a swami I was a monk in a situation in which there's a lot of respect given to monks um, the monks are fully supported and and to live a life that's quite separate from regular people's lives and I began to feel that it I really wanted to be teaching from a place that was much more equal mm -hmm. I was teaching so that you know so that I was dealing with the same issues um you know, the same you know some of the same problems I mean you know you don't stop being a monk just because you take off your robes but <laughs> But you know, when you step out of an organization, you have to pay the bills. So, so that was really uh, that was really what happened. And by that time, um, I just let let me just say I had certain skills, I had certain understandings, but it was a while before I felt really confident in you know in my authority as a teacher. It took a, it, I I really had to. Um, I had to do it for a while. I had to make mistakes. Um, you know, I, I had to gain confidence. And I think that that's, that's part of the journey of being a, being a teacher or a helper, you know, is that is you, you, at some point you just leap in, uh, and hope you don't hurt anybody. <laughs> you know, do no harm is really the first principle of anything as far as I can see. And, you know, and then you, then you develop. Uh, I do think it's important um, not to start teaching too soon, yeah. you know, and really to give yourself the opportunity to, uh, to develop, to cook. And, uh, and what that means, of course, is that we actually need to have a certain amount of, of personal self-confidence, personal self-love. We, you know, we have to we have to feel that our lives are meaningful and that we ourselves are meaningful no matter what we're doing because otherwise there is a tendency for people to become teachers or healers or helpers because it gives them a sense of purpose in their lives without necessarily having done as much inner work as they need to do in order to be really helpful. So that's the, that's the cusp there. I think that is so key and so important is that that last piece is mm -hmm. to be that like soul esteemed is to, to be esteemed from within and not stepping into teaching or serving in some way to be esteemed from the external and filled from the external. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and you know that's a lifelong journey. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, can we just say a few words about two pieces of work that you've done that are very easily accessible and are accessible anytime? And it's Awakening Shakti and Doorways to the Infinite. Yes. Two pieces of work that I recommend to. So, Sally, I have a bit of a confession. <laughs> Are you ready? This is my confession. <laughs> I am asked all of the time for resources on archetypes. All of the time. Yeah. 
And I, my answer is always, they are so much more than something that you can read about. And, and ev everything misses the mark. There's one body of work on archetypes that I feel contains the juice, <laughs> that, that contains the juice of archetypes and it's awakening Shakti. I, and I mean, I say that just with, I have gratitude for all the books written on archetypes, all the myths shared, all of the everything that's been done on goddesses and done on archetypes. But um, but that's kind of how I always reference. And I don't share many resources. I really don't share a whole lot of resources because it's really just going within, going within what is your relationship? What is your relationship? And get in the circles and be with the teachings and be with the practices and have a devotion to the particular goddess or the particular deity or archetype that you're working with and just dive in um, and have good teachers like we were just talking about. Um, but that that book's got some magic in it. It's got the juice. <laughs> So it does. It does. And I, and I, the reason it does actually is because it, you know, to a large extent it's channeled. I mean, I, I did a lot of research. I spent a lot of, I'd spent many years practicing when I read it, when I wrote it, but uh, the, the way I wrote it was by really opening up and asking each individual goddess that I was practicing with to, to really download her essence and in many cases they they did you know some of them i think are more uh deeply true than others uh some of them are you know wilder than others but it i i really kind of got out of the way when i was writing it and and uh i think that's why it has you you actually do get a kind of a download of goddess mm -hmm. in each of those yeah it's i also want to talk about my other book, which is called Meditation for the Love of It. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's a, uh, it's a kind of, it expresses the, the learning that came to me over 40 years of meditation of how to make your meditation practice your own. So it, there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's basics in it about how to meditate, but mostly it's about finding the art in your meditation practice. Uh, and uh, and that's, I would say a, it's that's a book that I think is pretty helpful for somebody who wants to step out of their, you know, their initial teaching, but wants to do it with a sense of what is important and what works and what they need to hold from the traditions and what they can let go of. I love that, and we just spoke about that in a circle that I held on Saturday. Was uh -huh. stepping into stepping deeper and deeper into your own unique practice and yep. really feeling into what is true, what most serves in my practice today, where am I most called today? And it sounds like this supports that. Yeah. 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 It's, it does. And it, it's, yeah. And I, and I, you know, we actually do need in our, in our practice, we need references. We need places that we can go and check things out. So that book does a lot of that. It's got, you know, it's got a section on troubleshooting, which um, is a compendium of all the questions that I've received in years <laughs> teaching meditation. So, <laughs> only so like I, one or two questions, right? Over. <laughs> so my teacher used to say there are 20 questions, there are only 20 questions. <laughs> and it's pretty true. Um, yeah, so I, I just, I think of these books as resources for people who, you know, who are really doing the exploration and that, and that's what they're meant to be just to help you do that, do your own exploration. And can you talk a tiny little bit about Doorways to the Infinite as well? Yeah, so Doorways to the Infinite is, it's an audio program uh, that's based on the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, which is really quite an extraordinary text. It's from the seventh century um, from Northern India. And it consists of a, it's a dialogue between Shiva and Shakti, between these mythological characters who stand for the, you know, the, the two aspects of the infinite. And, uh, and, in the, and it, the, it starts with the question, what is the best way to know the state of Shiva? 
um, the state of realization. We're having some Guatemalan gardener action outside. <laughs> so, and, and the, the book consists of 108 meditation practices uh, that, um, that you, can, you can do yourself, some of which are very sensually oriented, very much to do with the senses, some of which are literally meditations on emptiness, some of which you know, involve chakras or rising kundalini, some of which involve visualizations. So it's, it's actually a compendium of techniques and because it's an audio program i give specific instructions in each of them so you can you can kind of do the, the program as a retreat if if you're drawn to it's beautiful and so for anyone in our community who's been working in the realms of sacred union of even touching into sacred sexuality because i know some of those practices are really sensual practices um, that's a really great resource, I would say, for those who've been like dipping a toe into working with both of, of the energies, both Shiva and Shakti. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I want to respect the whatever's happening over on your side, but I want to just maybe ask if there's anything else that you feel to share, Sally, before we kind of wrap things up. Yeah, this was a delightful conversation, Sabrina, and uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. So um, may we, may we all unfold to our highest potential <laughs> now and in the future, in this very moment. Oh, that is so, so beautiful. And I'm, I believe the website where people can find the course and find everything that we've spoken about is just sallykempton.com. Is that right? Sallykempton.com. Yes. Okay. And I, there also, I also have a lot of meditations on yoga glow. The, actually it's called glow now. Um, there, I have, a, there are about 60 meditations with me on that site. So if you, if you go to glow and look under teachers, um, you'll find, you'll find me there as well. So and my website has a lot of stuff on it, a lot of articles and my schedule and little store where you can uh, download courses. So you, a lot of my courses are, uh, after, they've, after they've done live, we actually carry them on the website at a considerable discount so you can download the course and, uh, and take it on your own. Oh, beautiful. Sally, thank you so, 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 so much for this. It was wonderful. Well, it was my pleasure, Sabrina, and, uh, and your community sounds fantastic. So <laughs> congratulations on all the great work you're doing. Oh, thank you so much, Sally, and thank you to everyone who was here with us. Thank you all, and have a beautiful day, week, life, eon century, etc. So mm -hmm. love to all of you. <laughs>